Hi everyone, Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. Recently, it passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting, or even memorizing speeches. It's amazing how useful these strategies are. So, I put all of these episodes into one audio course. In the most popular of these episodes, I talk about how to use images of hippos and llamas to improve your memory. So naturally, the course is called Hippos, Aliens, and Llamas. Quickly master the tricks to a great memory. I think you'll really enjoy the course, and it's available now on avid.fm. That's A-V-I-D dot F-M. So find out what llamas can do for your memory by going to avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. I think you're really going to enjoy the course, and I know you'll find lots of uses for these strategies in your own life. So that's avid.fm slash memorymaster. You're going to get a lot out of it. Avid.fm slash memorymaster. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Psych Files. Are you a sensation seeker? That's what we're going to be talking about in today's episode. I talked about it way back uh, years ago uh, just because I, I'm fascinated by the kind of people who can jump out of airplanes or you know, do bungee jumping, for example. Really, in my mind, is like crazy stuff, but some people are drawn to that. And so I got in touch with the author of a new book. It's called Buzz, B-U-Z-Z. And it's Professor Kenneth Carter. And so I uh, asked him if he would come on the show, tell us a little bit about the the typical sensation seeker. What's it like to be in a relationship with someone who is drawn to this kind of thing? So I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. Now, if you're really into this topic of sensation seeking, you might want to check out this book. Okay, so I've got author Kenneth Carter on the line. We connected on Skype. So let's go to that interview. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You're a professor of psychology at the Oxford College of Emory University. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, yeah. So I was a first-generation college student, and I've actually always wanted to be a psychologist. It's, it's one of the things I was fascinated with when I was a, when I was younger, and so I went to college, uh, majored in psychology. I have a PhD in clinical psychology from University of Michigan. And my first job out of, co- of graduate school was actually working at the Centers for Disease Control as one of those disease detectives, people that learn a little bit about diseases all around the world. And then I was really drawn to go back into academia. And so I've been teaching at Oxford College for over 20 years now, and maybe about Five or eight years ago, I went and got a second master's in clinical psychopharmacology. All right. So then tell us your book. Uh, what drew you into to, you know, being, because um, I've talked about, it, I mean, I think it's a really interesting topic, uh, sensation seekers. And I talked about it, I think, in the first year of the podcast, but I haven't really touched on it since then. So I saw your book and I was like, oh, yeah, that's an interesting topic. But what drew you to the topic? Well, yeah, and if people, if any of your listeners hadn't listened to it, I, I, I listened to it was episode thirty-five, and it was a really great uh, dive into sensation seeking. And as and as you know, it's a really fascinating personality trait. But this actually wasn't the thing that I first was interested in learning about. You know, I, I'm a clinical psychologist. I teach psychology. I have a lot of students and friends that sort of lead chaotic lives, and my original idea of the book was to sort of write a guide to help people to lead less chaotic lives. Um, it was going to be called The Chaos Junkie's Guide to Life. And so uh, during one of my sabbaticals, I started diving into the research and I stumbled upon all of this really fascinating things from Zuckerman about high sensation seeking. And I wasn't that familiar with it initially. And the more I started reading it, the more I thought, this is sort of really what I want to write about because there are lots of academic books about sensation seeking, but I wanted to do something that was accessible and also weaved in the stories of, of the people who are these high sensation seekers as well. Yeah, I noticed that. You've got some various uh, people who I assume these are not their real names, but the stories around them are really interesting. 
All right. So for those who are not familiar with uh, high sensation seeking, uh, why don't you just kind of uh, ground us a little bit in the concept? Yeah, yeah. And so, and Zuckerman actually stumbled upon it by mistake as well, in some ways. He was originally researching sensory deprivation, sort of seeing how people acted in these sensory deprivation environments. And then he noticed that some people could stay in those environments for a long amount of time. And, you know, with no stimulation around them, they were really chill and that, that was fine for them. Wow. Yeah, those but, kinds of environments would drive me crazy. <laughs> Is that those the, where you're in a tank with water and salt yeah. water? Yeah. Well, he did different versions of it. He even did one that was called the Gansfield technique, where you sort of your eyes are sort of sort of covered in kind of like ping pong ball kind of things, and your hands are in sort of oven mitts, and you're you're sort of cast into fuzzy nothingness for a while. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 some people were fine, and they could stay there for hours, and they were and they were okay. <laughs> Other people couldn't stand it even for a couple of minutes. The curious thing was that there was no psychological test at the time that could predict who was going to behave in which way, even though they were so different in terms of their reactions. And so he ended up abandoning his research on that and started to focus on sensation seeking as well. And for those of you who have seen that um, podcast, episode 35, you know that there are different theories about what might be creating this high sensation seeking personality. But the idea is that people that are high sensation seekers are drawn to really complex experiences despite the risks of being in those experiences. Yeah, I had fun putting that episode together because it forced me to go and, and just go on YouTube and, you know, looking for sensation seeking. And and I remember finding a video um, about a ho about the horizontal uh, bunch of bungee jump where <laughs> you're sort of shot sideways. Oh, my gosh. Down, and you're shot into like a big uh, pile of hay or something like that. <laughs> it's like, like being at a circus or something. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but that's the kind of bungee jump I could do. At least uh, you're not more than 10 feet above the ground. Wow. Uh, but people do some crazy stuff. I mean, apart from bungee jumping, what, what do you classify as um something along those same lines. Well, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the sensation seeking, I mean, we typically think of people who are bungee jumpers or I've interviewed people who do wingsuit flying or you know, astronaut trainees, but there's another kind of sensation seeking, which is of, and which we'll talk about when we talk about the components of it, um, that, that focus on your sort of internal experiences. And so these can be things like people who are fearless foodies. I spent a about two or three weeks interviewing people who would eat just about anything. Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, it was really amazing. Fearless I mean, foodies. yeah, fearless foodies. I mean, I, I do not classify myself as that because I'm not a high sensation seeker. I'm, I'm a relatively low one. So I'm not really sure uh, how fearless my eating is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, my wife and I watch uh, Chopped. A popular show. And, and they've gotten to the point where there's all kinds of weird ingredients. Sometimes it's just a little hard to watch, actually. And I, I can't believe that the judges eat that stuff. Oh, my gosh. It's, it's And so for me, it would be hard for even to be able to want to try it. Uh, but high sensation seekers are drawn to that. There's a, an interview with a guy in the book that I always think about, and he calls those experiences the museum in his mind and that he's out to collect those experiences. And so it's not just necessarily adventure sports or bungee jumping, but it can be adventure travel or adventure eating even. And it's a part of their personality. And I think they're, they're really fascinating people. Interesting. I, I always thought it had to do with physical stuff like rock climbing. What's it called when you climb rocks without any rope? In oh, free solo. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. On the cover of the book, there's it's actually a slack liner. So it's a, it's a person that's on one of those sort of nylon bands. And there's a woman that I interviewed. She she wasn't in the book, but I did a podcast with her, um, and she calls herself Slackline Girl. So if you uh, take a look, if you Google that, you'll you'll see some of her videos. And she does this slacklining, which is like walking on a tightrope, you know, hundreds of feet feet above the air. But she also does it in high heels. Um, <laughs> and it's an amazing video to see. And she sometimes does it free solo without any harness at all. Slack line girl. I'm like on YouTube. 
Yes, yes, yes. Wow. She's easy to find. And, and like a lot of the people I talk to, they, they've thought a lot about why they do what they do, what they get out of it. And so it was a really fascinating thing to, to do to be able to understand their motivation from, from their point of view and layering in this idea of sensation seeking along the way. Yeah, the the um, wingsuit jumping looks like fun, but but I have to admit I I don't see myself as a high sensation seeker. And I took your scale that's in the book. Mm-hmm. I scored a thirteen, which is low, but but you scored even lower. Yeah, I scored about an eight actually, and so it's a scale <laughs> that goes from about eight <laughs> to <laughs> forty with higher numbers, meaning um, higher in terms of sensation seeking. And so average people around 25 or so, you know, some of the high sensation seekers I talked to were 35s, 38s, but they can be different based upon the different aspects of that scale. Yeah. Okay. Well, and we're going to get to that definitely. Before we do, those are the four components. Mm-hmm. Let me just, I've talked and most psych students know about the big five. Well, I mean, it's mm. the most established personality characteristic scale, which consists of uh, five components, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and eroticism. And there's a few mnemonics for that. I like the ocean mnemonic for that. So how, how or, or does sensation seeking fit in there somewhere? You know, so those big kind of personality ideas are, are really great. And sometimes they, they do explain lots of things. They're, I would they're, imagine, I'm sorry, yeah. I would imagine openness when, when you first posed this in the book mm-hmm. and I thought, um, open it's cause the full name of that first characteristic is openness to experience. Right. So do they score high on that? Yeah, they can score high on openness to experience for sure. The most surprising thing for a lot of people is that there's not really a correlation between extroversion and sensation seeking. Yeah, that's surprising. Yeah. In fact, there are a lot of, I, I, you know, I'm a little bit better at pointing them out, uh, but there are a lot of introverts that are high sensation seekers. Um, and sometimes it's the chillest sort of most sort of introspective kind of people that are those high sensation seekers. It's not necessarily at all correlated with that. So the idea uh, was, and I went through some of the uh, the different kind of big personality theories to find out which ones might explain it the best. And then I decided to go with a mini theory um, like Zuckerman's, which is like a special tool to explain something very small. But yeah, absolutely. I would absolutely say that openness to experience would be something that would be correlated um, with sensation seeking, but it might not explain all the little bits and pieces of it. Well, you know what you say, I mean, I make sense. I mean, uh, in terms of introversion too, because I mean, I mean, you can be a I'm mean, here. I'm guessing you tell me if I'm right. I mean, you can uh, be a sensation seeker um, and you get together with eight friends and jump out of a plane or you could be the kind that just goes off by himself and, and does the rock climbing. What was that called again? Without any oh, harness? Yes. Free solo. Free solo. Um, so now yes. you're all by yourself. So maybe you're more introvert. So um, it's how you express this characteristic. Okay. So, so tell us, you, you've come up with four components then. Um, yeah. Characteristics. What are they? And, th- and this, this goes back to Zuckerman's classic scale. And so, well, the first is called thrill and adventure seeking. So this is the thing that you would typically think of when you think of a high sensation mm-hmm. seeker. These are people who are out for uh, physical activities that are exciting and, and they can sometimes be risky. Then there's experience seeking, and this is sensation seeking of the mind and of the senses. It's sort of like internal sensation seeking. So you're not out for race car driving or wingsuit flying. This is more internal. So it could be those fearless foodies or people who like adventure travel or even people who are drawn to unusual other people. Any little points I got at sensation seeking were probably from experience seeking. <laughs> it's funny you should say that because that that's where I got uh, most of my points came from. That I mean, you've got um, these are like agree disagree. Uh, I'd like to explore strange places. I think that that's part of the experience one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that's the only thing that got me uh, a little higher than you on this. <laughs> yeah, thing. and so I would expect that a lot of people who are interested in psychology or psychologists um, would get some points there for sure. 
All right, so you've got thrill and adventure seeking, mm -hmm. and you've got experience seeking. Yeah, the last two, um, from my view, the first two tell me what kind of sensation seeker you are or the kinds of things you might be drawn to. The last two tell me how much trouble you might get yourself into <laughs> as a sensation seeker. So one of them is called disinhibition. Um, this is your ability to be unrestrained. Um, so those that score low on this trait always look before they leap. And those that score high, they just leap. <laughs> um, and the last one is called boredom susceptibility. It's how easy it is for you to get bored and how irritated you get when you get bored. Um, yeah, I remember seeing some research, but I have to talk about it in another episode, but I remember it was something that, you know, people would rather do this than be bored. I, you know, oh, so yeah. it seems like our culture, uh, people hate to be bored. Well, it's really easy to avoid it. I know like even, you know, I have a very low born susceptibility score. I can, you know, I, I can just sort of retreat into my mind and I'm fine. Um, but I know other people, if they're going to be, that they, they have this sort of fear of what's in that silence. And, um, I've always been a little fascinated bit with that. And so, uh, I think a lot of people are sort of do what they can to avoid that boredom. Interesting. Yeah. The, 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 so the reason why I, I say the last two tell me how much trouble you're going to get your, you <laughs> might get yourself into is that when people get really bored and they get is disinhibited or they're afraid of being bored, they may act more impulsively. Um, and so, I don't think that sensation seekers necessarily are going to get themselves into trouble with the kinds of things they do, but if they do it impulsively, it, it's, it's, it's possible that they might, it's, it's good to look before you leap if you're leaping off of a bridge. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. And do these things change over time? I mean, I, some of this is like, oh, yeah, well, that's your typical, you know, male teenager type stuff. Mm -hmm. but does it, you know, and then you get older and then. So have you seen changes? Yeah. So the research seems to suggest that um, there are a couple of things that are involved in terms of how it might change over time. Number one, it does tend to peak in early adolescence. Mm -hmm. And so people, this is probably why a lot of the videos you see online are of people who are, you know, those early adolescents. And then it does slowly get lower as people get older, partially because of changes in some chemicals in the body, MAO, for example, may uh, get lower as we get older. And then testosterone in both men and women does get lower. Mm -hmm. And those both are correlated with um, sensation seeking. But there's an environmental component as well. So a lot of people that I talked to talked about how either friends or family would at what would, they would pull back, they would ask them to pull back from some of their um, more dangerous things either because they were having kids or they felt like they had more to lose as they got older. Mm -hmm. And so these anchors can sometimes influence the, the expression of that sensation seeking as well. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, if so if you're a sensation seeker and then all of a sudden you get, you know, you got a kid on the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got, and that, so that's kind of where we want to go, though. I, you've got this really interesting chapter on, on what it's like to be in a relationship with someone like this. And at first I thought, oh, well, that, you know, it must be kind of difficult because that person will want to go off and, and, you know, jump out of a plane. But it's it also affects how they relate to you on a daily basis when, when, when they're not jumping out of a, of a plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a little bit about this whole idea of what, what it's like to be in a relationship with someone like a high uh, sensation seeker. Well, you know, the, the the one of the studies that sort of stuck out to me um, was a study what they that uh, was done where they had people and they measured their sensation seeking, and they had them also pick different topics of conversation that they might talk to another person about and also rate their sort of uh, beliefs in certain kinds of things. And then later they were supposed to say, well, do you would you rather have a conversation with someone that sort of shares these ideas, or would you rather pick someone that is completely different? 
And the high sensation seekers tended to pick conversation topics that they knew might cause some disagreement, which is not how I am at all. <laughs> like when I'm, when I'm meeting someone for the first time, I'm looking for things that are sort of similar where we have agreements. And I know people that are like, who like to what you know some people call poke the bear. And apparently some high sensation seekers, they, they like that because that's that experience seeking. It's, it's interesting and exciting for them to talk to someone that's not only different, but that would be sort of have controversial conversations with, uh, with a stranger. Interesting. I mean, that, that makes me think about, uh, you know, holiday get togethers <laughs> where <laughs> some people have to be told, OK, don't bring this up. Don't bring that up. Uh, because they're, they like to push other people's buttons. Right. And that's sort of part of their sensation seeking as well. Yeah. And they'll do that, you know, with strangers or people that they know, it's just part of their personality. So what is it like to, uh, to be in love with someone who has this? Well, so the, I first thought that maybe high sensation seekers would only find other high sensation seekers or be, or want to be in relationships with them, but it seems as though they're, they're, that's not necessarily the case. And so they're equally as drawn to other high sensation seekers as well as people who are low sensation seekers. Um, I think that sometimes the people who are low sensation seekers may have a little bit more trouble sort of understanding the motivations behind some of the things they do. And and some people have told me that they've read the book and that's actually helped them in their relationship a little bit, helped them to sort of understand like what their what those motivations are, are, are um, could be like. Yeah, because you could see how uh, well the the research tells us that uh, the among opposites attract and birds of a feather, uh, birds <laughs> of a feather is the one that wins. So we do tend to be attracted. We might remember the relationships we had with people who are very different from us. But when we settle down, it's typically with someone who is very much like us. Yeah. But the other thing is that some high sensation seekers, of, like there's a woman who told me, you know, not only do I jump out of perfectly good planes, I sometimes jump out of perfectly good relationships because I get bored. Boredom susceptibility is an important factor in some relationships where some high sensation seekers say that, you know, the relationship is really good, but I, I feel kind of bored. So I, I want to do something else. And so they may have a relationship that lasts a couple of years and they move on to, to, to someone else afterwards. Do they have more relationships overall? Um, they, they can. They can tend to. Um, it's not that the high sensation seeker um, is will not be in a long-term relationship, but that's something, especially if that bored and susceptibility is a problem for that individual. Because, you know, the, the longer in your relationship together, you know, th th it goes through different phases. You know, that first phase can be exciting and, and interesting to, the, to a person, but then you sort of settle into something that is sort of an everyday kind of thing. And I think that can be tough for some high sensation seekers who love that chaos. And so sometimes they'll create chaos um, because they operate best in that environment. Interesting. I wonder if any of our listeners are thinking about somebody they know. Yeah. And so there may be other ways to create chaos outside of the relationship that might be better off for the relationship. Mm-hmm. Well, now, there's a really interesting scale um, that you mentioned in the book. It's called keeping your options open scale. <laughs> <laughs> I figure only a psychologist would come up with such a scale. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, and, and I'm, I'm sure we've all been in that situation where someone's asked us to do something. It's like Tuesday and they're like, what are you doing this weekend? And there are some people who, who don't want to commit to doing something because something better might come up. Mm -hmm. um, and we probably all had friends who've bailed on us in the last minute. And is they, they did a study where they compared levels of sensation seeking with this keeping your options open questionnaire. And wouldn't you know, the higher your level of sensation seeking, the higher you tend to score on that kind of scale. So it, it, somebody who scores high on keeping your options open, um, they, they don't like to commit. Mm -hmm. um, 
other characteristics, kind of the short relationships, maybe. Yeah. So I've got a scale here. I can read a couple of items. Oh, right. one, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. One is um, I like to make appointments fairly far in advance versus I like to make appointments at the last minute. And so you can imagine that a lot of high sensation seekers would rather just wait to the very last minute um, to do those kinds of things. Or I sometimes put off deciding what I will do, um, and as a consequence, I end up doing nothing at all, as opposed to I try to decide well in advance what I will do so that I don't end up with, ha uh, with not having anything to do at all. So a, a lot of my, I, and this is making me think of one of my friends who who loves going on vacation, but she always waits to the very last minute to to book things, and um, and I think it's maybe because she's hoping something else that's more interesting will will, will sort of rear its head. <laughs> That's, yeah. Well, that's, the, again, that's very opposite of, uh, especially my wife, <laughs> everything. I mean, she's buying Christmas gifts in August, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just booked a, I just booked a vacation over a year in advance. Oh, you so, did? yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's the thing about academics. You know, I, I can tell you when my spring break is going to be three years from now. Oh, so yeah, so I, 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 we can, academics can live very predictable lives sometimes. <laughs> Um, and, and I'm going to guess that uh, maybe high sensation seekers are the people we see who, uh, on Black Friday. or. <laughs> <laughs> and you might think to yourself, oh, why would you do that? But for them, that is exciting. That, that getting that great deal, being in all that chaos, being, you know, getting something at the very last minute, rushing in just as the doors of the airplane are getting ready to close. You know, that's more interesting than getting there an hour in advance and having to sit there and wait. And so I think that their motivation behind those is to plan it so that they're always getting in under the wire. Wow. So in other words, it's, it's like you're being led along by this desire <laughs> to have a high level of excitement. Yeah. Yeah. And in the same way, I'm probably led along by having a sort of a low level of, you know, having a very predictable life. So a lot of the choices I make are based upon things that aren't going to change at the last minute or things that are very predictable. And so that goes back to the idea that your personality sort of pops up in different places around your life. Mm -hmm. So are these, in previous episodes, I've talked about uh, emotional intelligence, uh, which is the idea that you know what you feel and you can manage it. You can say, I'm feeling this way. I'm going to calm myself down. Uh, do they have that ability? Are they aware of what they're feeling? And yeah, they, they can be. The, the part where they may struggle a little bit is being able to understand what other people might be experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, and and that can sort of lead to um, some trouble sometimes. If you think about an example of two people in a car driving in a highway, we know that high sensation seekers, as you can imagine, drive faster. Uh, and they also can follow the cars in front of them very closely. Mm -hmm. And so these are the people, um, if you've seen people going, you know, scooting in and out of traffic, uh, driving really Really quickly. Yeah. Um, but interesting, of course, they're very chill when they're doing it. You may be the driver and have a passenger who is terrified of how you're driving. But as a high sensation seeker, you may not be aware of how terrified that person is because you're so focused on your own internal and external sensation seeking that you might not necessarily be mindful of um, what the other person is experiencing. That's what makes me think they would be difficult people in relationships because they're not tuned in to the other person. I, I mean, I, th I think in chaotic environments more so because physiologically they're not interpreting the, that chaotic, dangerous environment as being chaotic and mm -hmm. dangerous. So they may not know how terrifying the things they do can seem. But they're also, interestingly, um, when they're in sort of intercultural relationships where they're somewhere for the first time and they're in a culture that they're not familiar with, they actually are really better at being able to pick out those nuances because it's really interesting to them. <laughs> well, that is, that's different. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, you've, so you've, you've known couples where you've got two high sensation seekers. That sounds like it makes sense. <laughs> they, yeah. They love, yeah. To, they love to go, um, 
what is this thing called on the cover of your book? Oh, slack lining. Yes. Slack lining. <laughs> so they, they go slack lining together. But you've also, you've talked with couples in which it's very, it's opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what happens is that the one, the, the low sensation seeker tends to be the anchor for that person to remind them, Hey, let's, you know, the thing that you're thinking about doing may be more dangerous than you think it is. Or I want to remind you that you have kids and maybe mm-hmm. not to skydive as much as you might want to. And what happens is they end up doing more experienced things, seeking things together. Um, so the low sensation seeker may not want to bungee jump with the person or, you know, eat strange you know, uh, foods with that person or, or travel in the same way. I mean, there's a, there's a whole little section on travel and how high sensation seekers travel differently than low sensation seekers. Um, but they may define some similarities and there may be things beyond the sensation seeking that, that really keep the couple locked in together. So in other words, uh, one of them lets the other one, all right, you go off and do your thing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yes. Yep. And tell me all about it afterwards. <laughs> when you get back. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. It's funny. I, I mentioned a few times on the podcast that I, so I do. I'm involved in community regional theater, and so um, sometimes before I go off on, on stage, I'm like, "Oh my God, why am I doing this? This is scary." Um, <laughs> but I do it, and I get you know a rush out of it. I don't think I would call it sensation seeking, but lots of other people, especially my wife, would never get on stage. Yeah. 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 And it's the same thing with the high sensation seekers. I mean, they, that's, they almost universally, the people that I talk to, um, that say to me, Oh, you've written a book about high sensation seeking. What are you going to be doing? Mm -hmm. I always know that they're another high sensation seeker (laughs) because they want me to enjoy what they're enjoying. Um, they want me to sort of have that amazing sense of what they're doing. But I, I tell people, you know, I don't have the, you know, I can't run that program. My, my personality isn't really the same and I'm going to be overwhelmed in those chaotic experiences and I'm not going to be, it's, it's not going to be that fun for me for sure. <laughs> Well, we have that in common. <laughs> well, Ken, this has been a great conversation. I mean, your book is called Buzz. And um, where can we find it? Yeah. Um, well, cambridge.org slash buzz. Um, you can find it on on the Cambridge website. And then, of course, anywhere where you buy books, uh, independent bookstores or online, places like Barnes & Noble and Amazon. And um, it's available um, worldwide. Well, I congratulate you on the publication of the book and and a really fun topic. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks a lot and take care. All right. So pretty interesting topic, right? Sensation seeking. So uh, check this book out. I found a really interesting, really good read. It's just called Buzz, B-U-Z-Z. All right. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Michael Britt here. Take care. One last thing. Remember to check out my memory course. You can use these strategies to get better grades on your tests to remember people's names, and even help you to remember those jokes you keep forgetting. So you will be amazed. Avid.fm slash Memory Master. That's avid, A-V-I-D dot F-M slash Memory Master. Thanks.